Our next two speakers, no surprise, Roger Crone will be one of them. They are united in their work and in their shared desire to make the world a better place. This story is truly inspiring and I'm, right. I'm very um, happy that you're willing to share it today. So welcome back, Roger Crone and his colleague, John Hinman. I can stand. Okay, thank you uh, so much. Um, in the, the pre-work up to the conference, um, we were asked if we could maybe go a little deeper and actually kind of illustrate a story, share a story of, you know, kind of what, what Richard and the panel just talked about actually in, in action. And um, so I wanted to just relate one event, one series of events that happened at our company that um, led us to taking an action and, and hopefully making a difference. A little bit about preview on, on Lidos. So uh, we're 50 years old as a company. By the way, we're thrilled that no one knows who we are. It's actually okay. Um, but for 40 of those 50 years, we were employee owned. So uh, owned by our employees, and that created a culture of, of empowerment and involvement, but it also creates a legacy where my view is the CEO, you know, but we don't have an ivory tower. Um, I kind of sit in an office with, on a floor with everybody else, but I feel like I work for the 33,000 employees that we have in our company. Um, and I think like a lot of CEOs today, I answer my own email, I get my own coffee, um, and uh, my organization feels um, empowered to send me emails. And you know, usually it's about the food in the cafeteria or the parking lot or um, uh, one of those things. And what I thought I would do today with John's help is sort of relate a series of things that happened that led us to sort of enhance our program and to take some action around mental health and wellness. And what I'll, I'll ask John to do is to start by sort of describing some events that happened in, in John's life uh, with his family and with his son, Sean, and then we'll kind of pick it up from there. Okay. John. In, um September 19th, 2016, my family lost our son, Sean, to a 15-year struggle with uh, drug use, abuse, and eventually addiction. And um, my wife wrote his obituary, and we were public about uh, his struggles, and that was posted in the Pittsburgh Post-Gazette. And the Thursday uh, last viewing before he was cremated, his service was Friday, um, I sent the URL of his obituary to one of my colleagues, and the reason that I wanted to do so was because uh, our boys played soccer against each other. We were from different municipalities, about 16 miles apart. So between the time they were 8 and 14, they at least saw each other twice a summer to play soccer. About a year and a half before Sean passed, uh, this colleague informed me that... Uh, their son was now an opioid addict, and I provided counseling on what could be done. Uh, I sent the URL. My wife asked me for a drink of water, got her a drink of water, said I need to close my computer down. And when I got to the computer, it was seized with a virus. Called the corporate help desk to uh, tell them that I needed to have this addressed, and told them why I had to push it off until later in the evening uh, after 8 o'clock. 8.30, the phone rings, IT's on the phone. I explained, I apologized to the gentleman at the end uh, saying why I had to push off. And uh, he laughs and he goes, dude, it's 5.30, I'm in California. And I told him the reason why I had to delay. And at the other end of the phone, I hear, <gasps> and he goes, my son's an opioid addict also. And um, at Sean's funeral that Friday, uh, I, we received a call from the Pittsburgh Post-Gazette. Uh, the editor, one of the writers, Rich Lord, wanted to write a story 
about uh, our loss. He does a series called uh, Overdosed, and so he did. And those events combined to make me think about uh, doing something about our, our loss. And it was in uh, February of uh, 2017 that I encapsulated all of that uh, in a letter to Roger, and I simply entitled it a, a Father's Request. And basically I told him of what had transpired and asked if we could not be more and do more as a company. And we did. Um, I get a lot of emails. Uh, as I said, usually they're a couple sentences long. And, you know, again, it's, uh, it's whether we striped the parking lot correctly or something. And, and as I said, I, I read all my emails. Well, I hope most leaders and companies do that. Uh, this was very different. It was much longer. And, and I started reading it. And uh, John described the situation with Sean and talked about the opioid epidemic. Now, this was several years ago. And I started reading and trying to comprehend what had happened. And I have been blessed. We have three kids, my wife and I. They're all healthy. They're employed. They have you know, done reasonably well, although I've got uh, cousins and nieces and nephews, right, that have had some issues. Um, and so I walked down the hall to our head of community relations, public affairs, and I said, John talked about an epidemic around opioid addiction. What is, what is that? You know, I, I don't know what that, I don't understand that there is an, I haven't read it in the newspapers, I don't see it on TV, what is this? So we started doing our research. We did touch base with John. John um, uh, connected us with a lot of resources, Community Anti-Drug Coalition of America. We spent some time with the DEA, the Drug Enforcement Agency. Come to find, of course, where a lot of this started was in Portsmouth, Ohio, at one of the traditional pill mills. And so John works in Pittsburgh, it's almost ground zero, for the distribution of prescription and then illegal opioids. Um, the number at that time was 65 to 70,000 people a year die from opioid overdose. More than the people that died in Korea and Vietnam combined, more than uh, die from gunshots and automobile accidents in a year, die of opioid addiction. And at Lidos, about 25% of the work that we do is around healthcare. We do uh, healthcare, population health, uh, big data, data analytics, electronic healthcare records. And you know, the challenge from John was really, you're a healthcare company, right? We're a people-oriented company. We used to be employee-owned. What are we doing both to help our employees and to help and combat this epidemic writ large? A couple of weeks go by, and I get an email from uh, the office of our Senior Vice President for Corporate Communications, Melissa Koskovich, requesting to set up a dialogue with me. We set the time. After the introductions, she interrupts me. She says, you have to stop talking. Uh, what you did doesn't happen very much in corporate America. You wrote a letter to the CEO. She said it was a respectful letter. It was an impactful letter. She goes, but you got through. And she said, before we say another word, there's something that Roger asked me to convey to you, his exact words. You broke me down. We're in, we're all in. And it's been that way ever since. So it, it it caused us to think, but we, we tend to be engineers, um, it's just who we are. We tend to think about things in that way, that uh, problems can be addressed, problems can be solved if we think about them uh, in an engineering way. And so we broke the problem down. And uh, as you heard from the panel, we think there's a huge stigma and awareness issue 
We think there are some things we can do that are preventive in nature. Um, and then for those who do become addicted, um, there's treatment options. And so we broke our initiative down into three phases. We could spend the rest of our time going through each piece, um, but around awareness, we, as I, we've said before, we do events like these. I do a, a town halls with our employees. By the way, every time I do a town hall with a group like this who are our employees, as I'm leaving, there is always one or two of our employees who are standing to talk to me at the door on the way out. And it's about, uh, it could be Roxanne Woods and her son, it could be someone whose cousin, there's brother's son, a daughter, but there's, and you, you, can, you can see it on the way out, you can see it in their eyes that they have lived through uh, this uh, personal tragedy. Uh, by the way, in prevention, I could go on a lot of things. We do take back bags so you can um, pour your unused oxycodone into a bag, you can add water to it, and it inerts the, the drug. One thing that we did is, uh, you know, this is sort of a health conference, so we looked at our reimbursement policies and our benefits. And we went through our analytics, again, we're engineers, and we said, within our own 33,000, what are we doing relative to oxycodone? And we found that if a doctor prescribed a month's supply, then we reimbursed uh, the employee, the, the, the farmers, we're all self-insured for a month's supply. Um, and we said, well, what if we cut that to we will only reimburse a week at a time? Right? By the incidence of addiction go up dramatically after the first seven days. You know, after 10 days, you are at high risk for being addicted. After a month, it's a significantly high number. So what we did is we changed our reimbursement policy, not that you couldn't have more than a week's prescription, you just had to go back and get it renewed. All right. And then we sat back, first of all, I thought I would have you know, an onslaught of complaints from employees, but we went back and we looked at the metrics. So see if I can get this right. Before we changed our policy, something like 80% of the prescriptions that we reimbursed were for a period longer than seven days. After we changed our policy, less than 20% of the prescriptions asked for an extension, okay, which meant that there were medicine cabinets out there across the country uh, at the houses of our employees that had large unused dosages of Oxycontin, Oxycodone, or, or Tylenol-3 which meant was that was ripe pickings for their kids, their friends, people who are in their house, uh, by way, criminal elements. But when they break into houses now, they don't look for your jewelry, they go to your medicine cabinet first because a, a pill of Oxycontin could be hundreds of dollars in the resale market. So we, we made a change in the way, and we're, and we're thrilled, and by the way, it was a win-win, of course, we pay less uh, in prescription reimbursements. Our employees have less of these drugs in their household. Um, and then in, in treatment, lots of things that we're doing. One of the things I'm most proud of, we've partnered with uh, a charitable foundation where we provide the Chris Atwood Foundation funds and they buy something called naloxaprin or Narcan. If you're familiar with this issue, Maybe the, the, the dark part about opioid addiction is that there literally is an antidote. And if and you can uh, apply it through a nasal aspirator and it, uh, it is almost miraculous. It's like Lazarus coming back from the dead. And it, by the way, allows users to take more risk because of naloxaprin or Narcan. But what we do, we provide money to the Chris Atwood Foundation and if you will go through training so if you have, you know when someone who's high risk or you have someone high risk in your family, then we will actually buy the Narcan for you or, or your family member if you go through and take the training. So that if, in point of fact, you find someone who has succumbed to an overdose, you have a fighting chance, right, to uh, apply the antidote and to have, have them recover. And again, lots of other things uh, that we do across our employee base. Those are just a couple of the things. As, as Roger has very clearly articulated, 
I think in my estimation, it's the simple and profound spirit of we're in, we're all in, that guides Lidos in its opioid campaign, both for our employees and externally as we seek to partner with corporate America. On a daily basis, I'm honored that my voice was heard. It's not that I spoke, it's that this man listened and that the entire corporation listened. I'm honored that my voice has been heard, proud of what Lidos has done, is doing, and inspired by what it is yet to do. And uh, look forward to being a partner in this um, for the rest of my days as a Lidos employee. Well, great, John. The last thing I... <laughs> as we implemented parts of our program, it made me think how many other CEOs who have been blessed with a family like I have are just oblivious to the issue because they haven't had to confront it. And um, so I started talking to people that I know in the community and I was a little bit surprised that uh, CEOs in general were not as educated as maybe I had hoped that they, they would be. And so we started a, um, a CEO pledge and uh, have established a website, and I have sent letters to everyone I know, all the CEOs in the Fortune 500, uh, everyone I've ever come into contact with, um, a lot of uh, uh, private uh, companies, uh, where we provide educational material at the CEO level so they can see what we have done and how we have actually been able to make a difference in the communities in which we operate, how frankly, how easy it is, how much it's aligned with, I think, the corporate culture that we all want. And we have had hundreds of CEOs sign the pledge and, and return it, and we are collecting those. And by the way, there's a picture uh, on your screen. Uh, we were at a, at a funding event with the president where he signed a bill that funded um, a, a lot of, of uh, federal dollars for uh, uh, addressing this issue, and but eventually we will take our um, our CEO uh, pledges and we will uh, bind them up, and we have a, a White House event uh, planned again along the lines of education awareness, because if we do it right up front, and and more people are aware that this is a huge problem and we can make a difference, then we get to spend much much less on the backside which is around the treatment of, uh, of the opioid addiction. I mean, so we appreciate the opportunity to add this little personal touch to the panel, Kate, that we had, and just to let you all know that we actually can make a difference, and I think we can break the cycle, and whether it be mental health or addiction, I think there's a, a lot that we can do. And so, Patrick, we appreciate the opportunity to come up here and tell our story, and uh, we turn it back to you, so thanks. Thank you.